over the recent weeks, everybody has recognized that the current financial system is dead. And institutions all over the world have been talking about a new Bretton Woods conference to deal with the problem. Now, amongst the current proposals on the table, British Prime Minister Gordon Brown has been deployed on behalf of Imperial Finance, introducing a proposal which ought to be called the new Britain Woods. Now, this Britain Woods is a far cry from what Franklin Roosevelt called for in 1944. FDR's system, which was killed in 1971 with the takedown of the dollar-based fixed exchange rate, represented an end to the system of British colonial free trade. What Brown calls for is a continuation of that same British colonial free trade system, which is dead, which is stinking, and which ought to be buried. Now, if this Britain Woods were put into law, it would represent the triumph of the British system over the American system through the creation of a global financial dictatorship. Gordon Brown's Britain Woods calls for something along the lines of the Maastricht Agreements on a global scale, supranational regulatory bodies, which would supersede sovereign nations' capabilities to regulate their own finance. The real question is who will be managing these supranational authorities, and what are they out to protect? With most of the derivatives market held by offshore hedge funds situated in British territory, such as the Cayman Islands, you can see why the British are moving for control over any new international financial system. Now, if the upcoming monetary conferences are based on principles of national sovereignty, it's endgame for the British Empire. If these conferences result in a new Britain Woods, it's endgame for civilization. Lyndon LaRouche, the author of the New Bretton Woods proposal, has laid out four principles upon which any successful Bretton Woods system must be based. First, the Westphalian principle. This means perfectly sovereign nations working on behalf of the advantage and benefit of the other. Secondly, we must have a fixed standard of exchange for two reasons. First, having fixed exchange rates will kill speculation by starving it to death cutting off the oligarchy's ability to wage financial warfare against nations. Now, they've been able to do this by determining the price of money to gain a geopolitical advantage through stooges such as George Soros. Second, with a reliable standard of exchange, you can have treaty arrangements providing credit with the certainty that the values agreed to will be consistent decades down the road. Now, this brings us to LaRouche's third principle. Physical economic development among nations and infrastructure projects with a commitment to bring Africa out of the Dark Ages. Finally, for any of this to work, LaRouche's Four Powers Agreement with India, China, Russia, and the United States is required. Now, the United States is key because of its constitution. No parliamentary system, no other government in the world has the legal authority to run the type of bankruptcy reorganization necessary now. These constitutional principles allow for the generation, the utterance of sovereign credit by the United States of America. This credit, in the form of a US dollar backed by a commitment to production and industrial development, would serve as the reserve currency for the new financial system. Through treaty agreements, this new system would form the basis for bringing other nations into a credit system as well. Now, this were not possible without the power of the U.S. Constitution. The European parliamentary system does not allow for this. The Asian system does not allow for this. Even the Russian system does not allow for this. It must be the United States. Now, the British Empire is now forced to move to defend itself defending derivatives and hedge funds with this Britain Woods. And any time the empire fights to defend anything, this ought to create serious suspicion in any real patriot. Anybody who is serious about crafting international monetary policy 
and leading this world out of the current collapse into a dark age, ought to take a leaf out of former French President Charles de Gaulle's book when it comes to British shenaniganry and leave the British the hell out. England, in effect, is insular. She is maritime. She is linked through her exchanges, her markets, her supply lines to the most diverse and often the most distant countries. She pursues essentially industrial and commercial activities, and only slight agricultural ones. She has in all her doings very marked and very original habits and traditions. In short, the nature, the structure, the very situation, conjuncture that are England's differ profoundly from those of the Continentals. What is to be done in order that England, as she lives, produces, and trades, can be incorporated into the common market as it has been conceived and as it functions? For example, the means by which the people of Great Britain are fed, and which are, in fact, the importation of foodstuffs bought cheaply in the two Americas and in the former dominions, at the same time giving, granting considerable subsidies to English farmers. These means are obviously incompatible with the system which the six have established quite naturally for themselves. One might sometimes have believed that our English friends, imposing their candidature to the common market, were agreeing to transform themselves to the point of applying all the conditions which are accepted and practiced by the six. But the question, to know whether Great Britain can now place herself like the continent and with it inside a tariff which is genuinely common, to renounce all commonwealth preferences, to cease any pretense that her agriculture be privileged, and, more than that, to treat her engagements with other countries of the free trade area as null and void, that question is the whole question. <laughs>